This video is sponsored by Loot Crate, the monthly subscription service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear. More on Loot Crate at the end of the video. Hey Wisecrack, not a pickle Jared here, and today we're breaking down the season finale of Rick and Morty season three. In this season especially, Rick and Morty continues to flaunt the meaninglessness of our existence. Nobody gets it. Nothing you think matters, matters. This isn't special. This, this is happening infinite times across infinite realities. Every time the show's teased us with an authentic moment of love or emotion, it's ripped it right out from under us. My grandpa was my hero. Your mom wouldn't have accepted oh, me if I came home without you and your sister, so now you know the real reason I rescued you. Oh. I just took over the family, Morty. This leaves an interesting challenge for creating a TV show. How do you have characters grow when there is no meaning? Well, the show gives us a novel solution that's a little better than just spiraling deeper into nihilism. I guarantee you're gonna die if you touch me and there's no afterlife, everything just goes black. Don't do it. And that growth isn't from the titular protagonist, but the matriarch of the Smith family. Welcome to this Wisecrack quick take on the Rick Churry and Morty date. And of course, spoilers ahead. Okay, so first a quick recap. Rick and Morty are called in to help the president with some X-Files shenanigans, but soon bore of helping out the leader of the free world. Rick and the president begin an ever-escalating dick-waving contest. The two unleash their vast arsenals against each other before Rick has a more pressing matter to attend to. Jerry. Ow! Damn it! The more interesting subplot, however, is Beth's. Fresh off the events of Episode 9, Beth begins to question whether or not she had taken Rick's offer to be replaced by a clone, and if she, in fact, is the clone. To settle the matter, she seeks the help of Jerry, who recreates one of their first dates and rekindles their love. But still worried she's gone Blade Runner, Beth runs off to the woods with the family, where Rick shows up to kill Jerry and convince her that she's not a clone. In our last quick take, we talked about Rick informing Beth of what her intelligence actually means. Am I evil? Worse, you're smart. When you know nothing matters, the universe is yours. And I've never met a universe that was into it. Rick's answer to all this, of course, as we know, is don't think about it. Faced with this, Beth is given radical freedom to choose her destiny. And this freedom brings her solace about her choice to stay with or leave her family, regardless of which choice she makes. I don't know if I can do it. Then stay and luxuriate in a life you can finally know you've chosen. My secret bonus is that no matter what you choose, you're finally gonna chill the f out. But this episode seems to suggest that she chose to stay. Beth, you crazy bitch, you're my daughter. And as a newfound sense of happiness, she's being a better mother to Summer, sort of. I just put it on for fun, I know I can't buy it. Oh, come on, you look great. You're only young once. Just promise if the results are too strong, you'll use protection. Finally loves Jerry and has brought her family back together. We're a real family now. In many ways, things will be like season one. But for some, it may seem kind of weird that she suddenly rekindles her love with the helpless parasite that is Jerry. We could apply some of the philosophical themes we've identified in earlier quick takes here, like Sartre's bad faith and radical freedom, alienation versus agency, but I'm going to propose something a little new to explain why Beth reconnects with Jerry and her overall paradigm shift. Amor Fati, the cure for common nihilism. Now, what really made me think of this is this moment. My memory is of hating that night, but now reliving it, all I can feel is how lucky I am to be loved by such a simple, honest, simple man. This isn't the woman you married, Jerry. Beth, worried she's a clone, must now confront and question her past. Not only is she still thinking about Rick's original proposition, the ability to flee her past, but as a possible clone, are those memories even her own? And what does that mean for her future or her happiness? Amor Fati is a Latin phrase that Freddie Nietzschemeister used that means love of fate. Amor Fati is the affirmation of life, being what Nietzsche called a yes-sayer, not to be confused with the pervasive corporate yes-man, and it's tied to a thought experiment many refer to as eternal recurrence. To simplify, imagine a demon shows up and says he's going to groundhog day your whole life. Do you get thrown into existential despair because you have to infinitely relive questionable life moments like the popularity of Smash Mouth and frosting your tips in middle school, or do you, to paraphrase Nietzsche, high-five the demon and say you've never heard of anything more divine? To want to relive everything that's happened in your life for eternity, the good, the bad, and everything in between is the ultimate affirmation of life. 
advocates Amor Fati. And it's part of Nietzsche's grand plan to escape the crushing nihilism of existence. Given Beth's existential crisis and proclivity for Rick-like disillusionment-causing intelligence, Beth has to confront her past. I came to you for help, and now I'm insulting your intelligence, and look where intelligence gets you. And with Jerry, she gets to relive a small part of it. I just thought, it, lips don't sweat. And while she may have hated her life the first time around, including her date with Jerry, this time around she'll be that Nietzschean yes-sayer. But I don't think Beth is rewriting the past either. She doesn't deny the years of misery she has endured. Amor Fati isn't about some kind of everything is a blessing in disguise, but it's more about not to shun the ugly aspects of our lives. As she tells Jerry, she's no longer the woman he married. And sure, Jerry may be an idiot, but maybe simplicity is what a person with a family history of using intelligence to justify sickness needs. We see another Amor Fati-esque moment when Beth thinks Rick has come to retire her. I guess I was her, which makes me related to her, but I don't relate to her. She left her family, and me, which means I relate to them. Brushing aside the Blade Runner-iness of it all, Beth is also functionally saying, yes, a version of Beth may have chosen to leave, but I will embrace being left with my family rather than dwell on what could have been. And if you let me extrapolate a bit, while there may be infinite universes where Rick and Beth have made infinitely different choices, she wants to stay in this one. As Nietzsche says, my formula for greatness is Amor Fati. That one wants nothing to be different, not in the future, not in the past, not for all eternity. While Nietzsche didn't necessarily philosophize about infinite realities, he did write about the impossible task of knowing oneself. I'm out of excuses to not be who I am. So who am I? What do I do? Beth doesn't know who she is, but desperately wants to. For Nietzsche, the logic of why we actually do anything is impenetrable. And if we want to apply this Nietzschean framing to Rick, we the fans almost never know what actually drives him. Why would you do that for me? I don't know, maybe you matter so little that I like you. Or maybe it makes you matter. Maybe I love you. So while Beth can fret about whether or not she chose to be cloned or whether or not any of it matters in the infinite versions of herself, Nietzsche would say it really doesn't matter. All we can do is love our fate, and that seems to be the choice that Beth has made. And to me, this is really interesting, because while the show has often portrayed Rick as a kind of Nietzschean ubermensch at war with the meaningless cosmos, There is no God in your face! But Rick, in a quite un-ubermenschy way, doesn't really create his own new meaning as much as he just kind of dicks around in the most self-destructive way possible. Beth, on the other hand, when faced with the meaninglessness of the cosmos, finds happiness. And that's pretty ubermenschy if you ask me. Now, if you're like me and don't know what to do with yourself now that you have to wait probably forever for season four, consider checking out our Wisecrack podcast, The Squanch, where we broke down every episode of season three. Over the break, we'll be breaking down older episodes, engaging a lot more with your questions, and trying desperately to interview anyone who works on the show. And thanks to Loot Crate for sponsoring this video. For less than 20 bucks a month, Loot Crate sends you geek and gamer collectibles and apparel right to your door. It's the best place to go for monthly swag from your favorite franchises. And when you enter the code WISECRACK, you'll get 10% off a new subscription. Just saying. And the October Loot Crate theme is mythical. It's packed full of items from Stranger Things, Marvel, Buffy, and Ghostbusters, so you won't want to miss out on this crate. So click here or go to the link in the description to head to lootcrate.com slash wisecrack to nab those exclusive items from those epic franchises. You have only until the 19th at 9 p.m. Pacific to sign up and receive this mythical crate, so don't wait. Thanks to Loot Crate for sponsoring this video. I'm off to go fill the Rick and Morty void in my life with some carbs. Peace, guys.